This is the Webster Chicago 288-1 wire recorder, which was manufactured in 1948. It is the exact model that John Prophet used to capture the sound recordings we're featuring on the Living With Steam podcast. The entire unit weighed around 40 pounds, and the amplifier utilized five vacuum tubes. Many folks have compared the electronics on a wire recorder to that of an All-American 5 radio from around the same period. They weren't great, but they got the job done. Remember, this was 1948, many years before High Fidelity was created. This is the back of the unit. Behind the cloth panel is the motor, so this area serves as an air vent to try to keep the unit cool. Opening the unit up, we get our first look at the Art Deco design of the 288-1. The cover is removable. The underside of the cover contains hubs for storing five additional spools of wire. The two rubber pads are used to hold a wire spool and the take-up reel already loaded on the wire recorder. This feature was available in case you were making multiple recordings on a single spool of wire, and your last recording spot would be held in place if you needed to pack the unit up and resume recording at a later date. The power cord is inside this compartment. The mic would be in here as well. Webster Chicago Corporation of Chicago, Illinois was once a leading manufacturer of business and consumer electronics spanning more than half a century from 1914 to the late 1960s. Their product line included phonographs and recording equipment, public address systems, amplifiers, intercoms, and power supplies. In 1945, Webster Chicago became a licensee of the Armour Research Foundation and began manufacturing wire recorders, the first product being a version of the Armour Military Wire Sound Recorder, which it sold to the U.S. Navy during World War II. The stainless steel wire media was perfect for military applications, as it could withstand extreme temperature and climate variations in the field. When World War II ended, Webster Chicago continued to produce wire recorders and introduced a whole new product line oriented toward the civilian market. The Webster Chicago brand was one of the top-selling wire recorders ever made, and the company specialized in models for both office dictation use and the private consumer market. The units produced very lifelike sound quality, especially in some of the later high-end models, whereby the cabinet and amplification circuits were redesigned specifically for better frequency response. And the production run for the Webster Chicago wire recorders lasted from about 1945 through the early 1950s. Interesting of note, Webster Chicago billed their wire recorders as the latest word in dictation machines. According to one of their sales brochures, it is a truly portable dictation machine. It can be used in the office, at home, in a hotel room, and even in an automobile. Oh, it can be used on the side of a railroad track, too. This is the supply hub of the unit. This is where a spool of wire would be placed to either record or playback. Moving to the right, we see the record playback head, which is covered by a plastic cap. Next is the take-up spool. On the 288-1, this spool was removable so that you could quickly place a new wire spool on the supply hub along with a new take-up spool. Doing this would allow you to miss very little of what you were recording if you had to stop and rewind the first spool off the machine. The power cord is connected in the back and plugged into any wall outlet. For many of John Prophet's recording locations where no AC power was available, he would plug the wire recorder into a power converter like this. 6 volt DC from his car battery would be converted to 110 volt AC using a vibrator. This is the record listen switch. Depending on the position of the switch, you would either record onto a wire or play a wire back. Next is the volume control. This was wired in tandem with the output switch. In position one, the audio from the unit was routed out the built-in speaker. In position two and three, 
the audio was routed through the speaker and an external amplifier or speaker, but with a pad in line that would cut the fidelity down to minimize overdriving the external device. In position 4, all of the audio is routed through the external output jack. The output signal is controlled by the volume control in both playback and in recording. It's how you adjusted the amount of signal into the unit. This is the tone control, but it's also the main power switch for the unit. These two jacks are for the microphone input. The rectangular three-pin socket is original to the unit, but at some point, John Prophet had a typical quarter-inch jack installed and he had the connector of the mic altered to fit the jack. These two jacks here are for the external output. The round two-pin jack is original. The gold-plated RCA connector is a recent modification to allow for digitizing of John's recordings. Let's power the unit on. And now we'll load a wire. This is the typical packaging Webster Chicago used for their wires. As you can see, John labeled it accordingly. This spool holds one hour of wire. Out of the box, we get a look at the wire spool. The silk leader is there to get easy access to the wire itself. Without the leader, the wire tends to have a mind of its own when you try to thread it through the machine. Here you can see just how microscopic the wire is. Can you imagine having to untangle this? Splicing of the wire was done simply by tying two pieces together in a slip knot. Let's place the wire on the supply hub. But before we do, we need to note where the wire is physically located on the spool and then rotate the take-up reel so that the head will be on roughly the same horizontal plane as the wire coming off the spool. Doing this minimizes any binding that might occur between the head and the wire as it comes off the spool. The head is attached to the take-up reel by a series of worm gears, metal tracks, and a spring. The spring assists in pulling the head down. We need to rotate the take-up reel until the head is in the correct position. Now we can thread the wire through a slot in the head and onto the take-up reel. The leader is then locked in place on the take-up reel. In order to get a rough idea on how much recording time is being used on the unit, we need to set the timer control to zero. It's not 100% accurate, but it gives a pretty good idea on how much time has elapsed on a wire. When all is ready to go, let's place the unit into the listen position. Right above the output control is a neon lamp that indicates the presence of an audio signal. If the light goes on during recording, then you've got the input level set way too high. This is one of the reasons why John Prophet didn't like any loud noises getting into his recordings, like the unexpected whistle from a locomotive or an interlocking tower. The distortion was horrible, and the loud recording would actually bleed through to other parts of the wire. By 1948, it was realized that a portable wire recorder could be used for so much more than just recording the human voice. The sales brochure for the 288-1 electronic memory noted that the unit can be used as a hobby. Many electronic memory owners have made wire recording a fascinating hobby. They use the electronic memory just as an amateur photographer uses their cameras for recording such incidents as these. Wire record candid conversations with friends for later playback and fun. Secretly record friends' opinions on sports, politics, etc., and play back when these opinions have changed. Record weddings, parties, etc., as a favor for friends. 
burlesque serious speeches, opinions, etc. by incorporating humorous comments or changes of your own. Or make a fascinating and useful collection of on-the-spot sound effects of passing trains, five-alarm fires, or animals at the zoo. In looking over this narration, you could see how the wire recorder could get you into a lot of trouble. Here's a close-up of the wire passing through the record playback head. As the head moves up and down, it feeds the wire in a continuous helical form on either the take-up or supply reel, depending on the operation of the unit, of course. If this up and down movement ever failed, the wire would gather in one spot on either reel and bind up very tightly. It's next to impossible to get it loose. When John's wire recorder stopped working correctly, it was determined that the spring that assisted in the downward movement of the head had snapped in two. To compensate for this, I'm demonstrating here what John had to do in order to operate the unit. Once the head completes its upward movement, I place my hand on the head and push down against the drive system. When the head starts moving back up, I remove my hand. Now imagine doing this for over an hour. According to the counter, we've played back close to five minutes of the wire. When we're finished playing back, or recording, we'll stop the unit. If this were John, and he was waiting for another train to pass his vantage point, he'd just power the unit down and wait. He always kept the timetable handy to get a better idea of when the next train would be approaching. Back in those days, you were pretty much guaranteed that a train would be on time according to what was listed in the timetables. For our demonstration, let's just put the unit in rewind. Not only is the playback source audible during rewind, but notice the incredible speed with which the unit winds a wire back onto the supply reel. Can you imagine what would happen if the head ever failed to move up and down during this process? John lost many of his recordings due to the wire recorder's mechanical issues. After the spool of wire has completely rewound, the unit will automatically shut itself off. Time to put this spool away and get ready to listen to another. Not very often would John record on more than one spool of wire when he went out to capture his railroad sounds. Only at Bayview Tower, where the amount of train activity was so abundant that he would almost be forced to use another spool. I hope you enjoyed this demo of the Webster Chicago 288-1 wire recorder. It should certainly give you a better appreciation of what John Prophet had to deal with in order to make his incredible recordings. Be sure to listen to Living With Steam on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And head over to facebook.com forward slash livingwithsteam for additional pictures and other content.